Hello, I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocatorspodcast.com. My new book, Capital Allocators, How the World's Elite Money Managers Lead and Invest, releases tomorrow. I've been on a bit of a podcast tour the last few weeks, appearing on some of my favorite shows. I thought it would be fun to share an interview about the book here, so I asked Patrick O'Shaughnessy to interview me for the show. Our conversation covers the journey of the podcast itself and lessons from the book about interviewing, leadership, and investing. Pick up a copy at Amazon, and if you like what you read, there's more behind the podcast and the book. All listeners can sign up for our free mailing list and receive a compilation of the top quotes from each of the first 150 episodes of the show. And for those interested in more, our premium content includes a weekly email, further connectivity to guests on the show, and a whole lot more. Sign up for both at CapitalAllocatorsPodcast.com. Today's show is also sponsored by Coinbase Prime, a leading prime brokerage for digital assets. Coinbase provides the bridge to the crypto world for institutional investors, high net worth individuals, financial institutions, and corporate investors through their professional trading platform, deep and diversified liquidity, execution expertise, and Coinbase Custody, one of the largest and most trusted digital asset custodians. For institutions looking to enter the cryptocurrency markets, visit prime.coinbase.com. Today's show is also sponsored by Calvert Research and Management. Responsible investing is more important today than ever before. That's why sophisticated investors turn to Calvert, a leader in responsible investing for more than 40 years. Calvert's proprietary research integrates ESG factors with traditional investing. Calvert's active approach to investment management and engagement helps clients achieve competitive results and positive impact. To learn more, visit calvert.com slash CA. I hope you enjoyed the book and the discussion of it with Patrick. Well, Ted, I've been looking forward to doing this with you. I think we're going to go in all sorts of different directions, but since it's two podcasters talking on a podcast, I think we'll begin there. I think you were the fifth or sixth guest that I had on my experiment of a show early on. And then you probably started yours. I don't know, not that long after I started mine. So we've sort of done this together. It'll be fun for me to hear the journey. I've never actually asked you like what it's been like, why you made the decision to do it, how it's grown, what's been hard, what's been fun. So I want to do all that to begin our conversation. We'll also talk a lot about investing. You've got a new book coming out. We'll talk about that. But let's begin at the beginning. What was the impetus to get into this experiment in the first place, given that it's now one of the de facto leading podcasts for the institutional investing crowd? Well, it started here. It started sitting down with you when we first met, which had to be, I guess, four years ago or something like that, after my first book came out. So- I was in the spirit of transition and I was doing a couple projects here and there and we had sat down and done the podcast and it demystified it for me. It felt like we were just sitting down having a chat. And not too long after that, I had the idea of just running around and talking to some of my old friends in the endowment world mostly because I had spent so much time just focused on hedge funds. I didn't really have time to see what was going on. And I figured let's try it like this and share the conversations and see what happened. I had absolutely no objectives no goals with it. It was just something I was going to do on the side and scheduled a couple recordings. The first one with my buddy, Steve Galbraith, who just had a remarkable career and super interesting. And I recorded it with him and it was just awesome. And then I lost the recording. I could not, <laughs> I could not find it for the life of me anywhere. So I kind of thought the whole thing was doomed to start if you were listening to the, the, what the universe was telling me, but it just kept going. And I was doing some other work. I was helping a buddy get started running a family office. And that was waiting for a sale of a business. So there was a lot of time and I just kept going. And one thing led to another. And a couple of years later, sponsors started calling and it became kind of the main thing I was doing. So it really started as 
one of the few things that I've done in my life professionally that didn't really have an objective. It was a bit of learning and a bit of just kind of having fun and seeing what happened. Can you talk about the early days, how unusual it was to go ask people to do this thing with you and how that's evolved? Yeah, we used to talk about this. My first 50 episode, something like 45 or 46 of them were friends from the business. And every single one, I just asked for a favor because they didn't know what it was and I didn't know what it was. And you and I used to joke, like you would find your way from interesting person to interesting person and you never knew any of them. I'd say, God, how are you meeting all these interesting people? And you would turn and say, how do you know all these interesting people? <laughs> just a little bit of different in tenure of career. So it really started that way as just people I knew. I was an investor in the institutional world for 20 years and just have a lot of friends in the business and a lot of really, really interesting, smart people. And it was just fun to sit down and ask them about their story and how they think about investing. In what area from the first 50, let's say to the last 10, do you think you and or the show has improved the most? Probably style. I am a middle child and an extrovert by nature. I am not a natural listener. I was a talker. I was the kid in secondary school and high school that the teachers would tell to shut up all the time. And so in the early couple episodes, which I'm afraid to go back and listen to, I just think I talk too much. And I had to teach myself to bite my tongue. And over the years, that's become very natural. So stylistically, I think that's one. The other is the evolution of who the guests are at any point in time. I've kind of stuck to what I originally wanted to do, which was have a core of the show being around CIOs and to talk to them about how they're investing and how they think about investing, and then have some great managers along the way. And what's really fun are the other. So different thought leaders in different areas. That's been really pleasantly surprising how engaging people are willing to be. Say a bit more about the different categories of guests. So you started off with a lot of the big name CIOs in the endowment world, sort of all the big names in the endowment world, and it does seem to have gotten much more mixed. Is that because you're just curious and you're browsing around? Do you find yourself getting sort of tired of the CIO conversations, given that they're all kind of doing the same rough thing? What's behind the switch in composure of the guests? So I think it's a bit of a mix. I would start with there are a bunch of endowment foundation CIOs that I know that I asked on, and eventually I asked all the people I knew. And then it becomes the same, which is people will refer others to me. And sometimes those people are great, and sometimes I'm not sure. And I do think that because the type of capital that an endowment runs or a foundation runs is similar compared to a pension fund or compared to a wealth advisor, they do tend to have a similar way of looking at the world because of the nature of the capital. And so I just got curious about different models for managing capital. And it started when Ashby Monk introduced me to a bunch of the big sovereign wealth funds really in Australia, did some of the pension funds in the US and increasingly interested in things like the investment driven RIAs because that's a growing and interesting pool of capital. And so I think it's more been my curiosity in trying to constantly figure out if there's something incremental you can learn about the process and different ways of thinking about, call it a similar challenge of managing a big pool of capital. Let's say tomorrow I teleported you to a new firm that you were in control of that was as close to what you were doing prior to the podcast as possible. So you're a professional institutional allocator, like so many of the people that, that you've interviewed and you weren't allowed to do the podcast anymore. So you just have this new career and you're back to what you were doing prior to capital allocators. What things would you do most differently as an allocator as a result of what you've learned and the experience you've accumulated over the past four years doing this relative to what you did prior? I don't think I do that much different structurally in the sense that how you think about what the particular pool of capital is and how you might set your strategic asset allocation policy portfolio is probably not that much different. What's really different is the variety of tools that I've kind of learned along the way that go into that process. And you know, the whole first section of the book and the genesis of the book started that way. And it started because I had learned so much about decision-making, right, starting from kind of Annie Duke and Michael Mobison at a time where I wasn't actively making professional investment decisions that... I started to lose track of what all that knowledge was. 
And I just decided I really wanted to go back and distill what was in the episodes. And that became a chapter on decision-making. And that was the science, if you call it, of decision-making. I just wasn't privy to in the 20 years I was managing capital. And then you start pulling those threads. And I start saying, what are the areas that I didn't feel like I had the right teaching where I could have grown a lot? And that are repeatedly things that I think are not trained as people work their way up in the investment business, though they are in a lot of other fields. And that crystallized as one about interviewing, one about negotiations, and the other two on leadership and management. And I describe those as a toolkit. These are the tools of really a five-tool player, like CIOs of big pools of capital have to be able to do a little bit of everything. And these are fundamental disciplines that they're just not taught in the CFA. They're not taught in the investment business. They are taught in lots of different ways in lots of different fields. But those are the things that I think I would be much, much better at than I was when I was in the seat from the podcast. The most obvious of those five is, is interviewing, right? You've got, certainly put in your reps there. If you were back to just interviewing managers with an eye towards potentially investing significant capital with them, what are the major things that you've learned as a result of your 200 reps on the podcast that you would apply when assessing a manager. Yeah. I mean, and I'm still doing that. I'm doing it some with my own money. There's really a framework that is not hard to describe, but most of which I had not been applying. And so I'll lay it out. And we can walk through it. The first is really understanding the purpose of the interview. Then the next is preparation, setting the stage the right way, and active listening, and then feedback. So you could walk through each of those. The purpose of the interview is so simple. If you're in front of a manager you are trying to gather information about some thesis you have to invest. And what I found when I thought about it is that each different interview you could have with a manager, you could think about different things you want to cover. Maybe the very first interview, you're just gathering facts, trying to figure out, is this a fit structurally for what we're trying to do? Somewhere down the road, you probably want to do a deep dive on their process. You might want to do a deep dive on individual investments. You definitely want to do an assessment of the person and the team. Each of those things probably should be a distinct interview. And what I found when I thought back to how I did it was they all got moshed together. Like we're interviewing a manager and there's a whole set of things that we want to think about and they all come out in the same meeting. So you're gathering facts and then you do a deep dive and then somebody asks a great question about what the person does on the weekends. And sometimes you just don't get to the core of it because whatever the initial purpose of that one interview is, isn't clarified enough. So that's the starting point. Preparation is simple. Do it. I mean, it is shocking how often people just don't prepare. Pretty simple. There's materials in front of you. Read them. Take the time to do that. When I worked at Yale, that was religion. Like you never went into a meeting unless you prepared. Back in my years at Protege, when you're sitting in New York, there are so many meetings you can have that sometimes you just don't do the work you should ahead of time. Then there's the setup. So most of these manager interviews take place across the table. And in a physical sense, that is a directly confrontational setting, which is kind of anathema to the thought that you're trying to gather information from someone. So that inevitably happens because that's sort of the nature of business conversations. But you do hear things like when Scott Malpass talked about bringing people to Notre Dame for football games. And that's certainly something Dave Swenson did with the tennis tournament they had at Yale and lots of other ways. Having dinner with someone, going to events with them, you see people in different contexts. So that's one piece of it. The other is thinking about if you're trying to gather information, what does that imply about the nature of the meeting itself? Well, first, you probably want to make them comfortable. You want to ingratiate yourself to them. Maybe you talk about light things that you have in common, something that's going to get people to open up. What you see often in manager kind of allocator interactions is that allocators want to be the smartest person in the room and prove themselves. And so they talk too much. You're not going to learn a whole lot about somebody else by talking. You're going to learn by listening. And so there's a bit of that purpose. Like if the purpose is to gather information, why are you trying to show that you're the smartest person in the room? And so then I think ultimately it also comes down to humility to some extent, that manager is always going to know more than you about what they're doing. So let them, let them teach you and learn that way. And I think the biggest difference in what the podcast has taught me from the interviewing I did in the allocator seat 
is that our interviews in the podcast setting are not evaluative, right? We're talking to someone, learning, telling their story, and you get to go home and then share that with the world, and then they love you for it. It's great. I've had a number of manager meetings off the podcast for investment purposes in the last couple of years where I couldn't help myself but have the same lens because I'm just used to it. And it was amazing how much more I learned. And I'd walk out and go, holy cow, I now know more than I have about this manager in a long time because the style is different. So that's a big one. I do go in, in the book, the process of listening is a process. I won't go through it now, but there's a four-part structure of noting your own distractions, mirroring what someone says to make sure they're heard, being able to validate it that what they said makes sense, and then at times empathizing that is amazingly powerful everywhere from relationship therapy to hostage negotiation. I know from your conversation with Eric Maddox, same thing early on. And then the last one is feedback. So many people go through interviews and they don't afterwards evaluate how they did in the interview. And the beauty of the podcast format is we have to listen to these recordings to edit them. And you can hear yourself and you can hear where did you ask smart questions? Where did you fumble? What verbal ticks have you created this time around? And getting that feedback is incredibly helpful to getting better. Say a little bit about the off tape interaction before and after with podcast guests and like the different types that you've observed. I'll throw one example out there since I've got sort of similar data probably. One example would just be like, they interview it and they're like, great, thanks for doing this. And that's it, right? It's just very straightforward. Others might be really hands-on, like back to feedback. How do people try to do a good job or how do people interact with you as guests? Well, I go through a process where I make sure I talk to them before. So off camera, not the same day, hear a little bit about their story. And that can be a two-edged sword. I don't want to know too much about their story because I want it to be fresh, but I want to kind of understand what the framework and outline of the conversation should be. On the day itself, very similar. We'll have a little warm up ahead of time, but I probably have talked to them relatively recently. Get people these days with technology sort of squared away, make sure they're comfortable, and then have at it. Sometimes when you turn off the mic, the conversation just goes on and on and on, and you get these great insights and you wish you hadn't turned off the mic. But it goes all over the map. There are a lot of times you're like, hey, we just went longer than we thought we were going to. People are busy and great, we'll talk to you later. I do tend to have a feedback loop with them afterwards. So I like to go back to the guests as I'm going through the editing. And if I hear anything that I think will help them, I offer up if they're open to having some feedback on their public speaking. And that's kind of a fun thing to do too. What has been the craziest, you don't have to name the person, like the most notable experience of recording an episode and what made it so notable? The one that pops into my head is interviewing Anthony Scaramucci not too long after he came back from the White House. Part of that was I was scheduled to do the interview with him literally the Friday he was named to the press secretary seat. I had known him for years from the business. And part of it is he's just such an interesting character. People that hadn't ever had exposure to him were kind of eyes wide open about that episode because he's really an interesting person and in some ways very humble and in some ways much less so. And I think that came out. The experience part of it that was fun for me was that sometimes Anthony can't help himself. And he said one or two things only because it was such close proximity to coming out of the White House. I was afraid that if I'd put that out with those things he said, it might have like been in the news somewhere. They were fun, somewhat shocking, somewhat off color. And the part of it that was fun was I went back to him and I said, look, I really think you may not want this in there. What do you think? And he turned around, and again, we've known each other a long time. He said, look, I trust you, whatever you think. In the wrong hands, that could have been a problem. So that was one that I think if I said what they were, it'd be even more shocking. I'm not going to bother doing that. But he's an interesting guy, and that, that was one that stood out for that reason. The answer may be that you never have been, but do you ever find yourself nervous to do them? And if so, is there anyone that stands out as higher nerves than others? Very rarely. I think if I am, it has to do more with what's gone on with me and my life, and my head might be spinning from a bunch of stuff. It also, there's a cadence to it. So there are times where I do a whole bunch of interviews over a short period of time, and I don't do one for a couple of weeks. And sometimes after that, you feel a little bit of imposter syndrome, no matter how many times you do it. But not that much. I haven't felt that in a long time. What about the process itself of creating, I'll call it like a dream list, a group of people that you really want to get? and prosecuting the strategy to get them. I think a lot of the 
ones maybe that you and I would agree would be incredibly fun to do are unlikely. And of course, time helps this, right? You get bigger and more well-known and it becomes easier. But talk me through that process. Like how organized versus organic are you about who ends up on the show? Well, I've had a long list of people that I've talked to about coming on that I just think are exceptional from inside the industry. And some of that's timing. What gets interesting is if something piques my interest. So I have a bunch of stuff coming up on private equity. Well, private equity has been the rage for a long time. You know, you've done a ton of stuff with the very best people in venture capital. But I did scratch my head and said, look, all the real money in dollars is in old school leverage buyouts in private equity. And I just haven't done that much. The process of going from there to getting some of the very, very best people in the space to do interviews is actually pretty simple because most of the people I interview have money with them and they are more than happy to help out. And so I've got a run of episodes coming up with those principles that I think are going to be really, really fascinating. Hmm. That's an interesting angle. Who are you most excited about, whether you've recorded or not? I'm a little reluctant to say names right now because most of these I haven't recorded yet, but I'll say the run of private equity professionals that are coming up and I think it will be in May and June, are just extraordinary. So there isn't a single one of them that I'm not really excited to interview. Awesome. Can't wait for that. I agree that the leverage buyout area is definitely the area I've done. I don't think I've done a single episode on it, and I don't have any plugs into that world, really. So it makes sense. But I love the angle of going through the CIO to the guests, right? Leveraging the relationships you have. In that world, what's interesting to you? So the model, I would say, just putting our investor hats on, is a little bit more straightforward, right? The businesses are not huge question marks, right? Typically they're well-established. There's lots of metrics. You're doing basically similar analysis you might do on a public equity. What is interesting to you about the LBO space then right now? Like what will be the line of your questions? Well, the most interesting thing for me started when I started scratching my head and realizing that so many of the hedge fund professionals that I know when they retire no longer manage their money in a hedge fund format. They want to invest in private markets and mostly private equity. And you know, I had John Pfeffer on a number of years ago, and he was a private equity professional among operator. And when he described private equities, I was inside the sausage factory and I liked the sausage. And I've seen that repeatedly. So earlier in the year, I had on Paul Salem from Providence as kind of like an intro to this series. And Paul retired and he's doing deals. And so all of these people, they know the pricing environment's expensive. They know all the dynamics, and they think it's an incredible investment opportunity. So I was kind of curious, trying to think about why is that the case at a very basic level, but then also what is it that makes these particular managers that are all of some scale so successful in what they've done with companies? And they're all a little bit different, and they all go about things a little bit differently. And I think at the core, that's the essence of capitalism, right? These are owning businesses and trying to improve them. So it's a little bit less like when you'll do a deep dive on an early stage company and how that business works. I'm a little more interested in the kind of the subtleties of the investment strategy and how they make that work with a team, with CEOs, with operating partners, how the whole thing gets made. And then what do they think about the environment, right? We know they can borrow really cheaply, but they're paying a lot for companies, and you know, what is that going to imply for the future? How do you as an allocator with your own and when you're doing it for others, others' capital, and probably also those that you respect most that are allocating right now through this very interesting environment, how do you make heads or tails of or navigate this insane performance divergence? Originally, I would have said it was between growth and value, but now it's even a divergence between what I'll call speculative growth and growth. There's this chart that came out about non-profitable growth companies versus the NASDAQ, and they're crushing the NASDAQ for the last almost year now to an insane tune. It kind of goes against all the Swenson training, all the Buffett training, all the things that I think a lot of professional allocators came up on are being violated in front of us. How would you recommend people out there, especially the allocators, think about that challenge in 2021? Yeah. Well, I would start by saying, look, that is a, for the most part, a U.S. public market phenomenon, maybe global equity phenomenon. And that's just a small part of the investable universe. And so within that, this is an interesting time, right? There have been very interesting pieces recently by, in succession, Jeremy Grantham, Cliff Asnes, and Howard Marks on this value versus growth spectrum. And, and if you listen to Jeremy, the world's going to end as soon as value comes back. And 
Cliff still deeply believes in value, but it's a different lens. And then Howard, after talking to his son, who's a venture capitalist, had kind of said, well, there's maybe there's a different definition of value that just the simple factors don't pay attention to. My take on it has always been a little different from what I learned in my early years working with David at Yale. He was academically based, die in the wool, small cap and value. And one of the things that I've learned over the years, but especially the last couple of years on the podcast, is this idea that the long term that we all aspire to be, long term investors, doesn't really exist unless every part of the capital through the governance structure to the individual making the decision is perfectly aligned. And unless you're Dave Swenson and a few other select people, it's just not the case. So the long term for most people in the business is not 10 years. It might be five, which means that you can't really afford to be wrong for too long and still be in your seat. So that led me to think that it doesn't much matter what I think or anyone else thinks about growth versus value. You're probably better off being balanced between the two. Because if you get too far ahead of your skis and you're wrong, if you're right in the long term, but you don't survive to the long term, I think as Andy Golden said on one of the shows, finish first, you first have to finish. So that's how I've always viewed it. And the nice thing about that lens is that you don't have to know. You don't have to know, is growth going to continue to outperform value? Will there be reversion to the mean? Is it different this time? I know I don't know those things. And I think most people have very thoughtful arguments on both sides. And I would rather balance the portfolio, try to find really great experts on both sides, and let the vicissitudes of the market in the interim take care of itself. I think one of the other topics that's really interesting in the first part of your book is this notion of leadership. We've talked a lot about allocators here today. Usually they're giving money to managers who are then in turn evaluating other teams, other management teams, founders, whatever it might be. A common denominator here is just often that it's about people, that investing is very much a people business. What have you learned that stands out most about effective leadership, whether that be at the allocator level, at the manager level, at the operating level? What things would you hang your hat on now as key leadership principles from your your journey with the podcast? Yeah. I mean, I don't think the principles are that much different. And frankly, when you hear them, they just sound so obvious and simple. Although I would say that in my 20 whatever years investing, I'm not sure I ever heard anyone articulate it in this way. And so Really from some of the episodes of leaders outside of the podcast, one of my early episodes was with a decorated longtime Marine named Bull Gerfine, who happened to be a classmate at business school. And people would only know him because he was one of the two people that withheld Jack Nicholson in the courtroom scene of the movie A Few Good Men back when he was a young guy. And we know that in the military, they really train leaders. And so I was kind of curious to learn, like, what is it that real leaders are trained that in ways we don't learn in the investment industry. And I'd say there's sort of four parts of the basic core tenets of leadership. The first is vision. The second is standards. The third, communication. And then the last, kind of inspiration and motivation. And so pretty simple. It starts with having a vision. And I really got a lot out of interviewing Chandran Thomas, who's the head of Northern Trust Asset Management. And ostensibly, I was interviewing him as part of a diversity series. But everything he talked about in terms of how they engender diversity started with a vision and a notion of principles. And so I'll take one of my recent favorites. There's this young star asset manager who created a vision for his firm, Learn, Build, Share, Repeat. (laughs) So for those who don't know, Patrick, that's yours, of course. (laughs) Um, But if you think about that, what does that mean for the organization who's tasked with a vision of learn, build, share, and repeat? That's quite different from lots of other things that could be the core of an enterprise. But in a research-based kind of quantitative asset manager that's doing all kinds of interesting things with technology and software, it's pretty powerful. So it starts with having a vision and then... You go from there to standards, which is the vision is nothing if the leader doesn't follow the vision. So you could walk around and a lot of asset management firms have their mission statements on their walls. But if that vernacular is not part of the day-to-day, it's just an empty piece of paper. And in the military, there's this line, troop seat first. Super interesting. You don't see that in a lot of hedge funds. The notion that troop seats first, you got to take care of the people at the bottom of the pyramid to make sure everything works. And then there's communication. So you have the vision, you're going to show standards. 
this communication is this repeated process of reiterating the vision, reiterating the message, letting people know, taking examples, putting it in the vernacular of what that mission is. Mike Lombardi, who is a head coach with Bill Belichick and Bill Walsh in professional football, has this phrase, romps, R-O-M-P-S. And so he says, what you're trying to do as a leader, you need to command the room, command the message, command the process, and command yourself. And then the last piece is inspiration and motivation. They're different things. They're defined differently. I love how Randall Stutman, who's a fantastic leadership coach, describes this. He describes the term of fanness. Great leaders find lots and lots of different ways of constantly being a fan of the people on their team. And he asks the question, what would a fan do in this situation? If I was a fan of yours, Patrick, what would I do right now to show you support? And that's what great leaders do. What other key tools in the first part that you call toolkit stand out as especially useful to you personally that you've gleaned from meeting all these interesting people? I mean, I'll go back to interviewing because there's a couple of little tips that you and I have shared and I've kind of picked up along the way that I don't think I would have otherwise. And I'll just describe three of those and they're in that chapter. One is how you ask questions. Asking really brief, open-ended questions that usually start with the words how, what, or why are incredibly powerful ways to get information. And I hear myself all the time when I'm listening back to interviews expressing my view accidentally, saying, hey, Patrick, you know, you asked me that question about interviewing. Do you think that we really should start with a how, what, or why, or should it really be about who? And just like that, I've cut off your ability to just go with it wherever you want to go. The second one, which came from when I was in business school, is this notion of the five whys that came out of the Toyota production system, that if you really want to get down deep into the bottom of anything, all you have to do is ask questions starting with the word why five times. There are great examples of that, but you just keep going deeper saying, oh, well, why is that? Oh, why is that? And eventually you really get to the heart of the issue. And the last, which is a really, really simple tool that I came across by accident, is this notion that if you ask a compound question, the person on the other end will 90% of the time only answer the second part of the question. And most of the time when you ask a compound question, you're most excited about the first part. So you start asking a question, you're really excited to ask it, and then other thoughts come into your head and say, oh, and this and that. And they only ask the second part and you miss that great insight you had in the first part. So go ahead and ask that first question. When the other thought comes, just cut yourself off, leave space and let people talk. I definitely don't do that. I think I, I think I ask like four part questions most of the time. I can't contain myself, but I'll try. Uh, I'll try to be more brief. I love the toolkit. I think it's such a cool place to start the collected lessons from having talked to all these people, and especially on the interviewing front. I just think, I think our collective experience would suggest you can get a lot better at this. Like it's not like there's a Michael Jordan of this. A lot of it is just deliberate practice and getting out of the guest way and removing barriers to them telling you interesting things. So I think it's appropriate. That's the very first chapter of the book. I think people will really enjoy it. I would love to talk a little bit about investment frameworks here too, because let's face it, we both are primarily interested in investing as our primary professional pursuit. And I would hope after a couple hundred episodes talking to many of the best investors in the world, you pick up a thing or two on, <laughs> on ways to improve the investment process. And I guess I'll start there with just with process, broadly speaking. Now, I know you're, especially with decision-making and process, like you're extremely interested in, you can tell with some of your guests, how things get structured. So what have you learned there? Well, you know, I think that if you take process from a high level, there's not much to say about this, but everything starts with the purpose behind the capital. And one of the first real startling lessons I got with that was when I interviewed Josh Brown, the great, colorful Josh Brown, very early on. He was the first private wealth manager I interviewed. And I'd ask him questions like, oh, have you thought about private equity or hedge funds? And he just said, that we don't need it. We don't need it. Our clients don't need it. And at first, I was like, oh, that's such a pithy private wealth manager, unsophisticated. But then you step back and think about it. And he said, if he knows that his clients have capital that is there to fund their life, or as Brian Porton, I would say, fund their contentment. And they don't need these things to reach their objectives. He's absolutely right. And so you do hear like every pool of capital is a little bit different and it sounds cliche, but, but that, that's, there's not much to say about that other than it's very true. Probably the most eye-opening thing I found from the first couple of years of doing the podcast was how difficult governance is for these institutions. And I would define governance by 
if everyone's on board with the policy and the strategy, how inhibited is the CIO and the investment team from making the decisions that they think they should make to implement? And that came out of, I won't say who it was, but it was a former CIO of an Ivy League institution. And for many, many years, this institution was notorious for a bad governance situation. I never really understood what that meant. And a couple of years ago, I asked him, you know, of all the recommendations you brought to your investment committee, manager specific, inside the box, based on the strategy, what percentage got turned down? And that's coming from my perspective working at Yale, where that number is close to zero. Basically everything, unless there was a really, really good reason why, basically everything would get approved. And he said the answer to that is 60%. Wow. Yeah. And so, and I said, wait a minute, didn't you like talk to the people in the committee ahead of time? How could it be 60%? And he said, sure. Everyone would agree going into the meeting, but there was such a pissing fight in the boardroom and the egos were so big that people would turn stuff down for their own benefit. So the question is like, what does good governance mean? And I think that's pretty simple to say, a little bit harder to pull off. So the first is just clearly defined roles and responsibilities. Everybody knows if you're on the committee, you're responsible for policy, you are not responsible for manager selection. You are responsible for manager selection. You're not responsible for sourcing managers or whatever the case may be, but very, very clearly defined. There's a lot that goes into who's in that committee, sort of who's in the composition, what are the expectations? And I've been on investment committees and it's not that often that when you come in, somebody says, here's what we expect of you as an investment committee member. Here's how much preparation is expected of you. Here's the conduct that's expected in the boardroom. And then there's this constant communication between the committee and typically the CIO. And then the last part of governance that is completely screwed up in this part of the industry is incentives. I remember being part of a joke memo that we wrote to Yale's investment committee in the early 90s, making the recommendation to fire the investment office as the manager of the Yale endowment, because everything about what we believed in managers that were important were violated in the investment office. I'm sure that's evolved. But starting from compensation and all this kind of stuff, it's just... It's not done well. I think Harvard Management in, back in the day was the most notorious example of that. Maybe CalPERS, the most recent again. And so that was a big one, just getting governance right. What role does evolution of technology play at the allocator level? So we all kind of know how important technology is at the operating company level and tech companies have dominated and companies that aren't tech companies that have adopted tech have dominated and it's a well-worn story. But as you get up all the way to the pools of capital themselves, does technology play a role or is that too far removed from, you know, the boots on the ground or the code in the (laughs) code in the cloud to matter? It's a little bit more of the latter, but there's good reasons why. So where technological advance comes into play has more to do with the efficiency of information and risk than in making investment decisions. And the reason for that is fairly simple, which is that as you get a few layers away from the underlying asset, you have less and less data to go off of. So you could think about that and say, if you were an allocator, what type of technological advance would you want to be able to determine the difference between two great managers? Is it more data about their decision-making process? Maybe if they're high-frequency trading firms, but that's not most of where the investment dollars go. And so to some extent, that seat has delegated the use uh, and deployment of technological innovations first at the company level, and then to some extent at the manager level. There are ways that the increased availability of data and tools that really started in public equity portfolio managers that allocators can use to try to figure out where a manager's strengths are. And it's really in things like portfolio construction and disaggregation of returns and return drivers. And so when there's more data, there's more you can do. The allocator community and the people I talk to, we all talk about it a lot. Like it would be interesting if there were more data-driven ways to get at these decisions. I don't know that many people that have taken significant leaps. There are some current projects in process in those institutions, but I think it's not the right application. It really is the most people-driven portion of the investment industry. 
And switching over to the kind of area that I'll call managers, generally speaking, so no longer allocators, but the folks that allocators would hire to manage their money. What has changed from your earliest days meeting with a lot of managers to the managers that you meet with now that you're most impressed with? Yeah. In the public markets, if you think about the core proposition of a manager as picking securities and then constructing portfolios, there's just an insane amount of sophistication in the former. Ubiquity of data, speed of information, the sophistication and knowledge of how many more participants there are in competition. So we know that, that security analysis is really competitive. What's been interesting is that portfolio construction is actually more of a science than an art. Some of the inputs may be more art. So think about risk reward, think about upside, downside, some of the things that would go into inputs of portfolio construction decisions, conviction levels, things like that. But once you've done a bunch of selection of securities, putting together an optimized portfolio based on certain inputs actually is science. And you really saw this at the forefront in the multi-manager hedge fund platforms a while ago now. Think about Point72 or Citadel or Millennium. Lots of stock trading activity, lots of risk management, very tight risk parameters, and then the use of a lot of leverage. Well, if you use a lot of leverage, you can't lose a lot of money. So you have to be very, very rigorous about what's moving securities. That's only a certain style of investing. What you see across the board, though, is that people just are slower and coming around to using the software, the tools that are out there to sort of optimize the portfolios based on their own beliefs and inputs of the underlying security. So that's one. The second part is in and around entry and exit. So I think there was a research study this past year that showed that generally speaking, active managers are quite good at buying securities. They're just really lousy at selling them. And so with trading data, there are a couple of really third-party providers where they'll go in and look at trade data and help a manager understand effectively mapping behavioral bias to their trading. So when are they entering? What types of situations do they enter well? Do they enter quickly enough? Do they exit quickly enough? To really try to optimize the return stream that comes off of the idea generation. So that's probably the biggest side. You know, in the private markets, there's just so much less data. I mean, you could think about, it's hard enough just to measure what an IRR is. Is an IRR good? Are they using credit lines? But the irony is you can get a lot more information about the impact that an individual private equity professional had on the businesses they invested in. And so I think that's very qualitative, but you do see a lot of good work done trying to understand how impactful an individual is as a board member, whatever the case may be, in helping, I wouldn't say drive the outcome, but drive the probability of success. I think now at the end state that you've got so many of these lessons that clearly you're able to articulate very cleanly now, partially answers my question, but why write a book here? I've (laughs) I've written one book and it took forever. And I find that a conversation is more fun, much faster, reaches more people, sort of has all the best features. Why take the time to, I don't know how long it took you, I'm sure a long time to write the second book. Yeah. Well, I certainly didn't think I was going to write another book. And as I described in the intro of this one, the only thing writing a book does, once you've lost that naive boon of having your name on a book jacket, which you and I both have done previously, the only thing it does is suck up time and resources, which are the two things that are most scarce. Right. So I don't know other than it became my COVID project. And it started, as I mentioned, of wanting to curate what I learned in decision-making. And I just got excited about going back, listening to those episodes again, or reading the transcripts, and then creating effectively an outline for like my own roadmap. Because at some point, I probably will be back in the investment seat. And I was like, I'd like to have that on my desk. And then I said, you know what? It's kind of the same thing with leadership. And it's kind of the same thing with management. And then negotiating is a fun one because I believe I have been historically, hopefully that'll change, the, I'm trying to think of what the worst sports (laughs) franchise that is what I am in negotiations. And, and I took courses in business school. I just still lost every negotiation. But I had this one interview, the last interview I did before COVID, the last face-to-face one with Dalian Kane, who's a professor at Yale. And the way he taught it, I went, wait a minute, this actually makes sense to me. So again, I went back and I wanted to learn that. So originally the book was just that. And then I said, oh, there's all these great quotes. They're incredible. They don't quite fit into that. Let me just list all the quotes my favorite quotes from every episode. And that was the first version you saw. And I sent it to the publisher and they're like, yeah, that's not going to work so well. (laughs) So 
I went back and wrote up really the investment framework section and then curated some of the quotes that didn't make it into the first two sections by topic. And that's really fun. And that's the third section of the book. So you have the toolkit and the investment frameworks, and then both investment lessons and life lessons that are direct quotes from the show. What do you think is the most valuable aspect of the show from your perspective? What about it? Why did you do 200 and not stop at 10? Like what has kept you going almost four years now? Well, there are plenty of times I thought about, <laughs> this is getting to be too much. I want to go do other things. I think what's kept me going, 60, 70% of how I'm spending my time now is exactly how I have throughout my career. It's having conversations with smart investors. And I just love that. And so one of the things about the podcast that's different from just sitting in an investment seat is, you know, in the investment seat, you're just meeting money managers talking about investments all the time. In these seats, you can get exposed to all kinds of interesting people. And I've always used the frame of reference if I do a show on the podcast that's not directly about investing, am I going to learn something that I can share that will make a CIO better in their seat? So I've done a couple things in sports, and that's kind of a personal passion. But interviewing Ben Ryder, who wrote the book Astro Ball twice now, but the first time before the Astros blew up, it was like startling to me that what he was describing was the movement into quantitative finance and that baseball was ahead of investing. And that baseball had gone full on to quantitative money ball analytics and then realized you can't go that far and shifted back into that, call it quantumental. But at the time that book came out in 2017, it really felt like the world was going to be run over by quants and investing and that human side was a little bit missing. So there are always things you can pick up from interesting people that are kind of tangential to investing, but they're interested in investing. And so that's the part of it that just keeps me going. And the only other thing I'd say is that unlike the seat that I sat in, it's really fun to be able to do something for other people. And pretty much every single person who comes on the show gets something out of it for themselves. And that is, that's gratifying. That's really fun. You mentioned at the beginning, you, you began it, I think like I did as an experiment with really no goals. Has that changed? What do you think about the future of capital allocators, the ways you can extend the franchise? What are your ambitions now, many years into it? Yeah. Well, this last year, 2020, was the first year that it was the core of what I was doing. And it's actually been fun for the first time to think of it as like an entrepreneurial venture. As you know, I'm like hiring someone for the first time now. And so I don't think about the podcast itself any differently. I do not let people pay me to come on. I get offered at times and I won't do that. I just want it to be about the conversations that I want to have with great people in the investment business and people who can help us all learn. And that won't change. There are people who will benefit to have their name affiliated with that. And so they're advertisers and that's fantastic. And I'm trying to create more premium content so that people will pay a little bit to support it. And then the question is what else? And in accordance with following your lead as I've been wont to do over the last couple of years and Shundron, I created effectively my own vision statement for what this is that I'm doing podcasts and everything else included, which is to learn, share, and implement the process of elite investors. And so if I think about that compared to what I've done my whole career, the learning is always going on. I probably am sharing more than I used to for sure, and maybe implementing a little bit less. And when I think about where I'd like this to go, it's to balance that out. I don't want to share any less, but I'm looking to figure out ways to implement more. And, and maybe that will be what I've been doing, which is kind of coaching some managers along the way and working with some allocators. Maybe I'll get back into managing a fund because as you know, it is insane the quality of ideas that come through for one individual in a microphone. When I was sitting on a couple billion dollars, I'm not surprised great ideas would come through. But you get to see a lot of really great niche stuff. And just over the last year, I've started to invest my own capital and in the interest of sharing. Just recently, I put it out on social media. I was like, oh, here's my portfolio. Let me know what you think. And that part of it's a lot of fun. So that's where I think it's going to head. But probably the most fun part about it is what Josh Wolf calls the randomness and optionality. I don't know. I really don't know what will come of it other than it's really fun for now to keep having these conversations and it opens lots of interesting doors. And for me, it's all in and around the investment process and the investment business. And that's what I'm passionate about. And so I'm open to seeing what direction that goes in from here. I'll frame the last question I have as a fun framing, but really what I'm after is the areas of the business and investing world that 
you feel you need to learn more about where you're interested, but not yet well-informed. And so I'll ask it as if you could have a couple dream guests on that you haven't had that could help you fill in those gaps. What are the gaps and who are the guests? So those are two completely different questions because unlike the gift that you have for being able to go as a polymath in any direction and getting up to speed quickly, I actually enjoy staying in my sweet spot. And it's broad because I can interview kind of any manager, any strategy. But the one area that I know I don't know enough and is so important going forward is everything about technology. And so I get as much as I can from just listening to what you're doing on your show. But maybe it's a generational thing. I'm not sure. But it's so clear that what's happening with software and technology is driving everything. I just don't know as much as I'd like. So who are the right guests? I don't need them. I can just listen to your show. So they're not going to be on my show. But, <laughs> it's um, specialization. But I do think that it's a question of what to learn and how. Any dream guests staying in your lane, so to speak, and thinking about the areas that you've covered most frequently and guests that are either publicly or in just in your eyes, monsters in that field that you haven't had that, that you hope you have before the end of the show, if it ever ends? Yeah. So there are four, maybe there are more, four that come to the top of my head, three of whom I've asked and one who I am going to have on. So I've asked Warren Buffett three times. The most recent time, Tracy Britt Cool, who used to work with him for a long time, suggested I ask him again. She thought maybe he was starting to listen to podcasts and he might get it, <laughs> but it wasn't the case. So obviously, what I would want to do with Warren is not the same thing that everyone else has done, but to really try to curate so many of his early life business stories that led to where he is as an investor. You've heard some of those directly, and I've gotten a chance to hear a bunch of them over dinner. And they're so funny, and there's so many great stories, but he just doesn't want to do it. The second would be Dave Swenson, my first boss and mentor in the business. It's just not his thing. He doesn't do that often, and he's not going to do it with me. But I have asked him, I think, twice. And the third that I would hope for, maybe he's more likely to do it with you, is my old colleague, Seth Alexander at MIT, who's just, he's such a remarkable person, and he's done such a remarkable job in many, many ways at MIT, not just the investment results that that would be a real fun one. So the fourth one, who I actually think I am going to get on the show, I'm not going to say the name, I'm not sure when it's going to happen, but this shouldn't be a surprise, but I'm a huge sports fan. I'm a particularly big baseball fan. And there are certain former baseball players that are extremely well-known that have done super, super interesting things in the business world. And one of them in particular, actually two or three people have said, you should have this guy on because it kind of fits. Like he does all this investing and business stuff. And it turns out I know his, one of his very, very close confidants. And I think that will happen. So I will not say who it is. I don't know if it will, but it would be amazing. I'm going to guess after we stop recording because I have a good idea. I have one guess anyway. Well, it's an awesome lineup and it's been an incredible show. It's been really fun to have a front row seat as I have to watch you do it. I've learned a ton from it all. I think we're all very appreciative that you do it. So keep going. And definitely check out the book. I got to see all the iterations. It's awesome. Great distillation. I think you do an amazing job of distilling some of those chapters. So thanks for doing this today. But now, are you going to ask me? Because the first time I came on, you weren't yet asking people what the kindest thing anyone had ever done. Is that done right? I hadn't done it yet? Well, then, of course, I have to ask. What is, the kind of, <laughs> what is the kindest thing anyone's ever done for you? I mean, I asked you to ask me because it might be cliche, but it came up more in the last couple of years. So my parents never really had a whole lot of money. And I have an older brother and a younger sister, and each of us went through college and graduate school with no debt. And so that's amazing. It's an incredible start in life. My father just turned 88, and we almost lost him a couple of years ago. He's doing okay. He's doing fine now. But in that process, for the first time, we got a look into his financials because my mother was kind of like, uh, I don't know what to do. And what I found was that he had, I mean, this is like, Susie Orman basics gone awry. He had credit card debt, he had margin interest, and he had a mortgage. And then you start to think about this and ask when he got better, he said, how long have you had credit card debt? Well, basically his whole life. How about this high cost margin on your brokerage account? Because my dad, there's a whole nother story, but still owns IBM stock that he bought in 1959. Hmm. And effectively what the answer was, was he did not want us to have debt. And it did not matter to him that the cost of that debt from a numbers perspective was cheaper. Mm -hmm. And he would have been much better off today. 
because he did not want us to have the kind of stress that he felt as a young kid with that. And I was blown away by that. Now, I also had to instruct him a little bit about basic finance, and at least I got to (laughs) move around some of the the debt into lower cost debt. But it was was an amazing moment and appreciation. That is just what an amazingly selfless, kind thing to do. And yes, we're his kids, but not everybody's parents treat them that way. Fantastic. Well, geez, I'm glad I got the reminder to ask you. Such an awesome story. I just love the parents doing stuff for kids. I'm a sucker for it every time. I'm glad I got to ask it this time and spend the time with you as always, Ted. Thank you so much. Thanks for doing it for me, pal. Really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found a nugget or two to take away and apply in your investing and your life. If you'd like what you heard, please tell a friend and maybe even write a review on iTunes. You'll help others discover the show and I thank you for it. Have a good one and see you next time.